Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Lisa Truitt, President of National Geographic Cinema Ventures. National Geographic Cinema Ventures produces and distributes National Geographic's giant screen, 3D, and specialty films. Lisa has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Lisa, for joining us today. My pleasure. This has been such a fascinating organization to me, and I think to anyone who has experienced National Geographic's in its printed magazine form with the yellow box that ended up becoming the logo for the organization. Talk about the sensibility that informs your work and the work of the organization. Well, if I can go back in history a little bit, it's, it's very relevant, I think, to who we are today. Our second president was Alexander Graham Bell. And he had this, at the time the magazine was this dusty research journal, really for- An academic journal. Academic. And uh, he had this crazy idea to put photos in the magazine. And this was very scandalous to some of the board members. Cutting edge technology. Exactly. And board members quit over this issue. But it was that willingness to embrace change in the media world and to move forward with that, that really changed, set, set, a, uh, set a sort of pathway for those of us that followed and changed the future of the magazine. And so we've always felt that, that with that legacy, we had to always be looking forward to what was coming, to what consumers were responding to, what they were engaging with, and how we could best be there and tell these stories and engage the public around these stories. And exploration is, and, and storytelling are part of your DNA. The whole idea of not only exploring, but how you explore and how you engage these different means of exploration has been very important to how you pursue your work. Right, we're, we're very lucky in that we have evolved to both generate the news and then cover it. So we're a part of making these things happen that we feel are important to our mission and to the world and then to we also have the capability to tell those stories and get them out to the world, which creates this wonderful feedback loop where you can first engage, which leads to inspiration, which leads often to action, which leads to impact. And it's the, it's the fact that we are generating the science and the exploration at the very beginning of that that enables us to create such a strong feedback loop. The other uh, aspect of, of your work that I find to be very uh, interesting is that it's exploration in a very open sense. It's exploration with an intent to share, with an intent to expose. Mm -hmm. You're creating an open educational resource uh, before that became a term that was associated with open source software and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of free knowledge movement organizations like mm -hmm. Wikipedia and so on. You actually created information that the public could consume, mm -hmm. uh, but also with a, a strong scientific foundation. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, we've, we've actively in recent years really started looking for those early career scientists who had some kind of charisma or ability to communicate mm -hmm. beyond, you know, above and beyond the norm, if you will. And we're really working to cultivate those. You know, we, we found, arguably, found Jane Goodall. And she's a great example of what we see as where we need to go to find uh, scientists and explorers who are able to articulate and impassion people around what they do, and again, then to tell those stories. National Geographic has covered deep outer space to deep inner space, mm -hmm. has, has covered land um, and, and water and air and peoples and um, anthropology and civilizations, um, urban issues. Uh, what kind of bounds do you have? It, it's a pretty, it can be pretty broadly defined. The place we draw the boundary is, is really hard to define specifically. It's one of those you know it when you see it kinds mm -hmm. of things. Um, and we're certainly, as all are all smart organizations, constantly evaluating where are our core strengths, what are we good at, where are we taking ourselves off mission and off core. Um, because we're gonna all be stronger if we stay true to that core. Our position in the world on our access has been founded on neutrality. Um, we don't advocate that we have all the answers. There are other sides to every issue that are valid and should be aired so that our readers, our audiences can form intelligent opinions about 
what we're presenting. Um, often the evidence is overwhelming towards there is a problem here that needs to be addressed, uh, but we do really strive to present it in an objective way to maintain really that credibility and that access to the stories that, that some folks can't access. Could, could we talk about the various different types of technologies that you employ to uh, provide that experience mm -hmm. of the of the user or experiencer? I, I think technology is one thing that's kept a 126-year-old organization fresh, um, is that at our core is this knowledge that we must follow and respond to technological trends and audience trends to um, constantly be innovating around where audiences and consumers want to be found, where they are being found, where they're going, um, and innovating our media around that. I think if you ever feel like you've figured it out and you know how to deliver your content to the public and it's working and- Somebody events a 3D goggle and, and uh, a Google buys it and, and all of it, or Amazon buys it and all of a sudden- And uh, it's completely consumers. different. And that is called the Oculus Rift and right. it was just bought by Facebook. And it is arguably uh, an IMAX experience for an individual at home sitting in front of their computer. So we're among the first to be out there talking to them and looking at what this means and how we could innovate around that. Uh, so you have to maintain uh, an entrepreneurial spirit within an organization that is old and entrenched. How do you assure that there's uh, not only the, uh, the ability to retain people who um, mm -hmm. are making these contributions and, and showing a symmetrical loyalty, but also um, ensuring that new members come to the team in mm -hmm. a budget-constrained environment where in order to get these new members to come in, some of these members who have been there for a while need to also leave. leave. Yeah. You know, that's, a con that's management, right? There, there are sometimes hard decisions that have to be made. Um, some of it comes naturally where people decide to move on and, and do something different for various reasons, then that gives you an opportunity. And some of it is, is hard decisions and the need to, as the media landscape changes, there's always a need to reallocate your talent and your strengths and your sort of human power into right. different areas. So as one thing's growing, this group may not need as many people and as much resource behind it. And so you reallocate and that dictates where you're gonna shrink and where you're gonna grow. And do you, do you treat part of your talent pool as subcontractors and part of them as, as full-time people? Part to of some them extent. I mean, I think definitely when we're on a big project or a project that we don't know where it will, is going to go, it makes more sense structurally to bring on people as contractors and, and test the waters before you commit, um, you, before you jump in with both feet and hire people on a permanent basis. In, in terms of assuring product consist consistency as you, as you go from these different products with different modalities, um, do you have a standards or quality assurance um, uh, group that, that is part of your uh, process of vetting projects and, and, um, and reviewing projects before release, or is that more inculcated into the culture of everything that you do? It's both. I think the leaders uh, like, my, like me who are deciding what projects to bring into the development pipeline have an instinctive understanding of what fits, what could be commercially successful, and also serves the needs of the brands and whatever funding partners you're going to need to bring in to, to realize that project. Um, once we've got a project in the works, it, and if there are questions around that, we do go to our standards and practices group and sort of say, could you vet this and give me some feedback and we make a more collaborative decision. Often it's a little more clear cut than that. It's kind of clear that a film, you know, on the Everglades is gonna fit our mission. Um, but then once it's in the pipeline, we've, we've maintained this reputation for so long by being really sensitive to scientific input right. and getting it right. Um, and being able to still keep it entertaining. How large is the organization that, that you manage? Can you give us some sense of, of, of its, its scope? Of my group. Of your group. My group, there's about 10 staff folks, but it's augmented by a handful of contractors that are 
you know, feel like staff to us. Mm -hmm. um, and then each project has a dozen up to ultimately when we're in the field, 85 or 100 folks on each project. So there's varying levels of how you look at. And how many projects are you running in any year? Uh, I, at various stages from development through production, through distribution, marketing, and release, probably 15 at any given time. But again, in very, those right. have varying demands on my time. All right. So you might um, have several hundred people with ver at various stages who yes. are um, reporting into these uh, projects. So yes. your project management approach must be very sophisticated. You must have very complex budgeting uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. And then once a project is budgeted, then delivery and managing all the detail through that. Do you have a project office that, right. th that deals with those Well, issues? I have, I mean, with 10 staff people, right. it is very small. And I often joke about how I have departments of one. Right. <laughs> um, so there is marketing, there is project management, uh, there's distribution, and there's fundraising. And with 10 people, you can imagine how large each of those groups are. But yeah, we make it work. We augment when we need to. Right. Um, you know, you keep the core staff thin so you have a control over your costs and flex and grow with, with um, a team of sort of insiders that are on the outside as you need to. So your, your core team of people who are full-time are people who work across different projects. They're, they're Correct. Sort of expertise is project management and budgeting Correct. and finances and so on. And then the other people come in and out, and you probably use the same people across projects right. in, certain, in certain cases. Right, so they have a familiarity with how we work and what our requirements are, which are particularly on the factual accuracy and quality side, often more stringent than, than mm -hmm. others that they're used to, but they get to know what we need and they learn the system. And um, if they're good and, and we know they can deliver and we can count on them, it only gets easier as you build those relationships. How do you make decisions on what you cover when you are considering projects? We make decisions uh, by considering a number of factors. You have to create something that uh, audiences will want to see. So you don't want to put something out that, that is seen as good for you or medicine because you will attract the people that are already in that camp and adherence to love that. Love castor oil. Yes. <laughs> People that love medicine or spinach or whatever it is you want to call it. Um, I happen to like spinach, so it's an interesting analogy. But um, so, so I look at it as a, um, a matrix of will this entertain? Is it marketable? Can I sell it? Will theaters or museums or whoever my clients are on that particular project embrace it? and buy it, and then how can we engage people around it to create follow-up engagement and, um, and, and impact? Whatever that is, for every project, the impact is different. This, the additional thing I would add to that matrix is funding, because often to create these things, you have to ha I have to have outside funding, um, whether that's from a government agency or a corporate agency or philanthropist. And so not only does it have to be something the public will embrace, it has to be something that's that's practically Fund fundable. Funders would like to fund. Um, and that you can, or that you can find, there may only be one funder out there that cares about this issue and has uh, goals around this issue that are aligned with your goals. Um, if they're not aligned, it's not the right fit right. because someone will compromise and that's not where you want to be. But you find the right partners and if they're out there on a particular project and those other things line up, then you've got a good one. So I know every project is your favorite project and your most recent projects are probably more favorite than, than, than others, but nevertheless, certain projects likely loom large in your mind? For various reasons. For various <laughs> reasons. People often ask me, what is my favorite project? And, um, you know, I always say, well, favorite, why? <laughs> you know, most fun, best outcome, most enriching. You know, there are so many ways you can measure the outcome of a project. Um, but 
you're probably right in that the most recent two uh, do loom large in my brain. Um, I'm just finishing up a project I've been working on for three years with Jim Cameron. And that's been interesting on so many levels and challenging on so many levels. But this revolves around Jim's dive to the deepest spot in the ocean in the spring of 2012. He built, financed, built, designed a submarine that was capable of doing that. No one's ever done it solo. It's been done once with two people, um, but they Take, took so long getting down there, they landed, they stirred up a cloud of silt, they saw nothing, and they went back up. Right. So Jim is a big believer in, in the need for innovative engineering, and um, often from the pi private sector, and the need to explore these vast, unexplored right. areas of our planet. So this project encapsulated everything National Geographic is about in so many ways. So I've managed that whole project from the expedition the press, the media around it, the awareness around it, all the way through to a feature film that we'll release this August. Um, and, and the components of those projects are so interesting because you're doing a, a film on a way of thinking, a sensibility, a philosophy. You're doing a film on technology. How do you mm -hmm. actually accomplish the outcome that you wish to have? It's a bit of an adventure story. It's definitely a story of trial and error and hardship and, and never letting go of a dream. What we find is when people see it, they have the result, the, the reaction that I would have dreamed of, which is that they're inspired. And they walk away and say, I want to remember my dreams. I'd forgotten my dreams. I want to, and people have very tangible things. They, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. I let go of that. And so you've got them there in a place where you can now have a conversation with them. And the connection between real risk, real risk, and real accomplishment. Right, exactly. So, so people have connected with, I, fi I find often people, we all know this, connect with a human story. So you suck them in with that human story. It's a public figure. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. You've got them. You've got their attention. You've engaged them. Now what do you want to do with them? And so that's why I've thrived on not just making movies, but then turning those movies into much bigger impact projects. To experiences. Now what do you do? What is my dream? How can I go about it? Um, how can I talk about it? Uh, how can my teacher in my classroom use this movie to teach about engineering, about trial and error, about the importance of failure, about all of these things? Um, but I truly believe that, that the way to capture people to, to get to the point where you want to get is through an emotional, immersive experience of some sort. Um, film is one of those. And we get right back to the decision by Alexander Graham Bell to include photographs in an academic publication. Exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, it, to take those risks. Thank you so much for sharing so briefly and in such a intense way the work of National Geographic Cinema Ventures. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, it's been a complete pleasure.